Well, brethren, I'm sure we're all familiar with the words of Psalm 103 that our Heavenly Father knows our frame and remembers we are dust. And I find great comfort from that whenever I have to speak after we've had a lunch and I know what it's like to be where you are. Your blood is now rushing down here to work on the food you've put in your gut. And it means often there's not quite as much carrying oxygen up here. And it's very easy to drift off into the land of Nod. Well, the Lord who made us to function that way, he knows our frame. So let us together seek his face for the special grace needed to have alertness in a session after we've had a good lunch. Let's pray together. <coughs> our Father, we are indeed grateful that you are our loving Father who knows altogether the work of your hands. And so we come looking up into your face, believing that you, fully conscious of who and what we are as creatures of the dust, that your heart is toward us, and that you have made a covenant commitment to supply all of our need according to your riches in Christ Jesus. So we pray that out of those riches you would give us every needed dimension of grace to maintain mental and spiritual alertness as we would wrestle together with matters crucial to what we are as men of God seeking to serve you acceptably in the work of pastoral labor. So help each one of us, we pray, that when we come to the conclusion of this hour, our hearts will instinctively run out in thanksgiving and praise that you have heard and answered our prayer. Hear us then as we make our plea in the name of him whom you did not spare, and having delivered him up for us all, how shall you not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. 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 Well, we continue in this session our consideration of the life of the man of God, uh, seeking to complete what we were not able to complete in the previous hour with respect to his spiritual life, health, and vigor. I said that there were at least five disciplines ordained by God as a conduit or a means with the blessing of the Holy Spirit to convey to us the grace and spiritual life that is inherent in our Lord Jesus, but which he pledges to pour into us as living members of himself, he being the vine and we as the branches. We had time only to deal with the first three, namely the devotional assimilation of the word, the habit and spirit of secret prayer, and then the maintenance of a conscience void of offense towards God and man. And so I want to take the first part of this lecture to at least identify and briefly address the fourth and the fifth discipline before moving on to our second major subdivision, the man of God, in reference to his intellectual growth and development. Discipline number four, I've expressed this way, that we ought to consider engaging in periodic seasons of intense self-examination and protracted seasons of prayer. That we ought to consider I did not say we ought to, and I cannot from Scripture bind my conscience or anyone's conscience and put this in the same category as the disciplines of the devotional assimilation of the word, the habit and spirit of secret prayer, or the maintenance of a good conscience, but surely there is much in Scripture to nudge us into a serious consideration of whether or not it would indeed contribute to that real, varied, expanding, and original life with God if we engaged in periodic seasons of intense self-examination and protracted seasons of prayer. 
And let me set before you two categories of reasons why I believe we ought at least to consider this as a discipline, if not essential, yet greatly contributing to our spiritual growth and vigor. First of all, the scriptures record such instances of periodic seasons of protracted time with God. Though there are things peculiar to his unique place as the mediator of the old covenant, those seasons when Moses had his extended times shut up to his God, Daniel setting himself to seek the Lord by prayer and by fasting, the call of the prophet Joel to the entire covenant community, even to bridegrooms on their wedding night to forget their bride and to give themselves to seeking the face of God. The example of our Lord Jesus, his night seasons of prayer before critical periods in his life and ministry. The Apostle Paul with respect to his thorn in the flesh, for this thing I sought the Lord three times. Obviously, they were not three ejaculatory prayers, but three seasons of intense seeking of the face of God that God might remove that thorn, whatever it was. And again, the apostle who could speak, not only being in seasons of hunger, that's something that was imposed upon him by the providence of God or the meanness of others, but he said, in fastings oft. And then surely the assumption of our Lord when he's correcting the thinking of his disciples, contrasting their devotional exercises with that of the Pharisees, he not only corrects wrong thinking about almsgiving and prayer, but fasting. And when he says, when you fast, you shall not be as the hypocrites, the assumption being that among the community of his followers there would be seasons of the voluntary relinquishment of the normal indulgence of physical appetite to the end that they might give themselves to prayer. So surely, brethren, this bulk of scriptural data at least nudges us in the direction of considering whether or not we too ought to engage in periodic seasons of intense self-examination and protracted seasons of prayer. But then there's a second reason, and it's what I'm calling Christian biography that underscores the benefit of these extraordinary seasons. One cannot read through many Christian biographies without finding that at certain points along the way, the person whose life has made such an impact upon his own generation and subsequent generations that the biographies continue to be reprinted generation after generation, almost without exception, those kinds of men, those kinds of women, were not strangers to these seasons periodically engaged in for seeking the face of God in a protracted way. And if someone should ask the question, why should they be necessary? I answer for a number of reasons, and my answer is certainly not exhaustive. Perhaps the most fundamental is because of the frightening power of indwelling sin that can dull our spiritual sensitivities, that can lead us into what to us is almost an imperceptible state of spiritual dullness. And it is in more intense seasons of seeking the face of God, deliberate self-examination, doing what our Lord commands the church at Laodicea to do, not at Laodicea, at Ephesus. Remember from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works. A season of remembrance of where we once were. What were the patterns of our devotional life? What were the patterns of our ruthless dealing with sin? What things did we once recoil from with horror that we can now tolerate without a twinge of conscience. Many times there is a creeping weakness and degeneration in the soul that does not come into focus in the ordinary course of our devotional disciplines, but a season of intense 
self-examination of protracted prayer and fasting can be the means that God uses to help us to face more realistically that insidious, frightful power of our indwelling sin. There's the dulling influence of constant contact with holy things, where once we spoke of them with present feeling. We can now speak of them with consistency and accuracy, but no longer with present feeling. The soul becomes dulled by its constant contact with these things. And then the draining influence of involvement in the manifold tasks and burdens of the ministry. They can simply wear us down to a season of protracted waiting upon God becomes a means for the refreshing of our souls and the quickening of those graces of the inner life. I like to think of the maintenance of the aircraft on which we fly. I think most of you are probably aware that there is a schedule of aircraft maintenance. Every so many hours of flight, standard maintenance is uh, enacted upon the various parts of the aircraft, but every so many thousands of miles, certain parts of the aircraft are stripped of their skin. The main spar undergoes careful x-ray and examination for any stress cracks. And without those kinds of more radical examinations, I don't want to fly in the thing. The standard day-by-day, week-by-week maintenance is not enough to ensure that that aircraft is a safe means of transportation. And so it is with our souls, the daily discipline of seeking God, reading and meditating upon the Word of God is like the standard maintenance of that aircraft. But occasionally, we need the skin stripped off. We need the x-ray upon the substructure of the soul to bring to light what may be some dangerous areas of spiritual declension. Lamentations 3 and verse 40 is a call from the prophet to search ourselves and to commit ourselves to such a discipline. And then we come briefly to number five, and it's what I am calling, we ought to consider engaging in regular exposure to the masters of the inner life. We read in Ephesians 4.11 that Christ is given to his church pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints unto works of service. And you and I, though we are God's gifts to the church, that through us there might be a perfecting of God's people unto their works of service, we are yet members of the body, and we need the exercise of those gifts in us and upon us. And I love the statement of the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 trying to cut the nerve of this carnal attachment to this preacher or that preacher, the apostle says to them at the end of chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Those whom God has given to the church in past days and whose ministries have been particularly owned in being masters of what I call the inner life, the struggles of the soul, the windings of remaining sin, the things that will keep us fresh in our relationship to the Lord. They are God's gift to me. They are mine as his gift. And I ought prayerfully and wisely, judiciously to own them and to use them not as masters of my faith, but as helpers to my faith. And when I speak of masters of the inner life, I'm referring to such works and authors as John Owen, volume two of the 16 volumes, Communion with God, volume six, Indwelling Sin, Temptation and Mortification. How many times as I've gone through those I don't know, probably some of those treatises, five, six, seven times. And I say, Lord, did I ever read this before? How could I have read that? 
written what I wrote in the margin of its profound impact upon me. And Lord, I've forgotten that principle. I've forgotten it. Few, few take us into the inner life like John Owen. The first time I read his treatise on mortification and then on indwelling sin, I felt like someone who was about to believe that there were such creatures as little Lilliputians. I felt like God had shrunk a man, stuffed him in my heart with a searchlight and a notebook, and he was writing what he saw. I felt so utterly exposed. How could someone know me as this man knew me? And what a means of grace dear John Owen has been to me in my walk as a child of God. Volume 7 on spiritual mindedness. Marvelous material worthy of being read over and over again. John Flavel in his treatise on keeping the heart. Proverbs 4.23 Guard your heart above all that you guard for out of it are the issues of life. Brooks precious remedies against Satan's devices, the privy, that's P-R-I-V-Y, there should be no E there, the privy key to heaven, Bunyan's treatise on prayer, Hayward, heart treasure, the works of Sibs, Baxter's, the reformed pastor, Bridges on Psalm 119 that I've mentioned, and also his commentary on Proverbs, uh, Scudder, The Christian's Walk, Octavius Winslow's Works, The Glory of the Redeemer, The Precious Things of God. These are the books that I mean when I'm talking about masters of the inner life. I have found in my own experience that often these men are a help. I call them my pump primers to take four or five pages when I sit in the chair that I use for my devotional exercises and, and the wheels of engaging God seem to be moving slowly and seem to be sunk in the mud. Four or five pages of one of these men often lift me out of that state and begin to move me upward and outward to engage God in a meaningful way. That's what's happening these weeks as I work again uh, for the fifth time through Bridges on Psalm 119. Morning after morning, God is just meeting with my heart, and I've fallen in love with Bridges all over again. And read his cross-references. This is what has amazed me as I've gone through this time. Generally, when he'll put a cross-reference to validate what he said, I skip over it. But this time, I'm taking the time, more than I have in the past, to look up those cross-references. And this man's mastery of his Bible is utterly astounding. He does the same thing in his commentary on Proverbs. Don't gloss over that. If you only get one verse of Psalm 119, sometimes it's three pages, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Take the time and you will find by the word of God the heart being stirred and drawn out. And there's such a Christ-centered fixation in Bridges. He finds Christ again and again and again in ways that are not forced, in ways that warm the heart. And so, my brothers, if you are not regularly exposing yourself to the masters of the inner life, I urge you, pecking away a little bit at a time, a few pages a day, that these may prove to be a great means of grace as you seek to have this real, this varied, this expanding, this original life with God and acquaintance with Him and with His ways. So in summary and concluding my treatment of these means that God has given us for the development of our inner spiritual life, what I want to say, my brothers, is give yourself, give yourself diligently, determined by the grace of God that in the battle of the basics you will not flinch, you will not quit the battle, but maintain this discipline of devotional assimilation of the word, the habit and spirit of secret prayer, a good conscience before God and man, periodic seasons of intense self-examination and protracted seasons of prayer, maintaining regular exposure to the masters of the inner life. And if in spite of all that, there's no freshness, no expansion, no increase, 
It's probably because you're dead and you're not converted. There's nothing there to expand and increase. And may God grant that none of you will appear before God as an unconverted pastor. Now then, we've concluded our treatment of that first basic area in the life of the man of God, his life spiritually. And we now come to the second major subdivision, what we are as men of God intellectually. And with respect to the goal of our intellectual development, I set before you the following statement. You must seek a maturing spiritual perception of the truth of God, both in its objective essence and in its practical application to the world of men and things. And as we ease our way into this aspect of our study, let me begin with a word of caution and qualification. And the word of caution and qualification is this. We must not think of this isolation and division of the spiritual and intellectual as if they were ironclad or airtight compartments of reality and of experience. They are not. It should be obvious to all of us that the intellectual faculties are vigorously at work in the disciplines essential to a real, expanding, varied, and original life with God. The issues I addressed in the previous lecture with you are as far removed as from mindless mysticism as night is removed from day. Since it is by the truth that we are sanctified, John 17, 17, the activity of our minds in relationship to the truth is vital in our spiritual development. Further, if it is by the renewing of our minds that we come to an increasing experiential acquaintance with the will of God, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect, Romans 12, 2, then there can be no totally mindless spirituality. People may think they have a spirituality while being mindless, but that is not true spirituality. However, having made that qualification, it is indeed perfectly possible that a man of God may experience no little measure of a humble, vital walk with God with the necessary intellectual exercises involved in such a walk, and yet fall short of his maximum potential for usefulness because of intellectual sterility, laziness, or lack of general intellectual discipline. In other words, there is a sense in which a man may indeed be set in his heart to love God with all his heart, but is not set with equal diligence to love God with all his mind. Therefore, while fully recognizing the areas of overlap and interpenetration, we must of necessity consider the intellectual development of the man of God as a distinct category of concern. Now, having given this word of caution and qualification, let me proceed to the first of the two major divisions of the lecture materials. Number one, an explanation of this axiom or principle. I have asserted that the man of God must seek a maturing spiritual perception of the truth of God, both in its objective essence and in its application to the world of men and of things. Now let me break this statement down into its major components and seek to explain them. First of all, the fundamental area of concern is our intellectual development with respect to the truth of God. Now by the truth of God, I mean the unchanging verities revealed to us by God in the books of general and special revelation, but with peculiar concern towards special inscripturated revelation. 
It is the perception of these verities that ought to be at the heart of our intellectual pursuits and activities. We ought not to be found often dabbling in theories or in heresies or in error, but in the substantial realities of truth. And here we do well to listen to the sagacious counsel of Alexander, page 172, in the quote that you have in your notes, the bottom of that page. The mind must be allowed some periods of calm, interrupted, uninterrupted reflection in order to librate freely and find the resting point between conflicting views. That time is sometimes expended in learning, examining, and collating arguments of all kinds on different sides of a given question, which might, by a much more compendious method, have served to discern and embrace positive truth or to make deduction from acknowledged truth. No wise counselor would proscribe the perusal of controversies, yet, yet, he who reads on different sides must necessarily read much that is erroneous and all tampering with falsehood, however necessary, is like dealing with poisons full of danger. If we might have our choice, it is better to converse with truth than with error, with the rudest, homeliest truth than with the most ingenious, decorated error, with the humblest truth than with the most soaring, original, and striking error. The sedulous perusal of great controversies is often a duty, and it may tend, I had to laugh at the use of these next words, accumulate the dialectical faculty. He's writing to students who in his day would know what that means. To accumulate, accumulate means to sharpen the dialectical faculty, the ability to examine and weigh uh, opinions. So we might say uh, the sedulous, the diligent perusal of great controversies is often a duty and may tend to sharpen our ability uh, to discern issues with which we are wrestling. But none can deny that it keeps the thought long in contact with diverse falsities and their specious reasons. Now these same hours would be employed far more healthily in contemplating truths which in their own nature are nourishing and fruitful. To confirm this, let it be remembered that truth is one while error is manifold, if not infinite, Hence, the true economy of the faculties is, wherever it is possible, to commune with truth. Again, while error leads to error, truth leads to truth. Each truth is germinal and pregnant, containing other truths. Only upon this principle can we vindicate the productiveness of solitary meditation. And then he goes on to amplify that exhortation all the way to the top of page 175. And he urges the student to be very careful in coming in contact with error. Far better that the mind be thoroughly impregnated with truth. Just like the person who in our governmental system is responsible to identify counterfeit bills that are produced by the Federal Reserve. They spend most of their time not examining all the various counterfeits, but by mastering all of the distinctive qualities of the real thing. And when they have, by feel, by a glance, they can detect the counterfeit. And so the mind of the man of God must be so conversant with truth that when he confronts an aberration, he's able to detect it, not because he has spent an inordinate amount of time dabbling in the aberration, but so soaking his soul in the truth of the living God. So then, when I say that we must seek a maturing spiritual perception of the truth of God, it is this to which I am making reference. Then I've used the word a maturing perception of the truth of God. 
When something is mature, it has reached its full development or its native ideal. The mature tree has reached to its full potential. I planted a tree in celebration of the successful removal of my prostate gland in July 10 years ago as a monument to God's goodness in all appearance, early detection, complete removal of the gland and any cancer in my body. And I was told by the tag that attached to that tree at maturity, it will be 30 feet high and approximately 20 feet in width. Well, it has almost re reached its maturity in just 10 years. When we say of a child, it has all the appendages that it will have in adulthood. Two hands, two eyes, two ears, a mouth, and all the rest. All the internal organs, but they have not come to their full development. And so when I speak of this maturing perception of the truth of God, I'm not talking about going from a mind full of confusion as a babe and throwing off error and imbalanced perspectives, but those truths that are implanted in the soul in our initial encounter with the grace of God in Christ through the gospel, that they develop and flower and come to an ever-growing fullness in our understanding the expansion of our understanding of what it means to be a child of God, of who Christ is, of all of our privileges in a state of grace, of an ever-growing understanding of our duties and responsibilities, an ever-growing perception of the wonderful integration of truth and how truth not only begets truth, but beautifully dovetails with truth. That's what I mean by this maturing perception of the truth of God. And when I have used the word spiritual perception of the truth of God, I'm using the word spiritual in the New Testament sense, that which is given by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Godhead illuminating our minds in the truth of God. The one who alone can enable us to grasp spiritual realities so as to behold them in their inherent beauty and to feel their weight and the impress of their weight upon our souls. To understand their implications for thought and for practice. So when I say spiritual, I'm not talking about something that bypasses the cognitive and the intellectual, but an operation upon the intellectual faculties of the Holy Spirit himself. And then I have said in my maxim or major principle that it is an understanding of spiritual objective truth, a spiritual understanding in its objective essence and in its application to the world of men and things. And by that I'm simply attempting to underscore that there is a clear statement of truth. Timothy, hold fast the pattern, the form of sound words. Contrary to much of the mindset of our generation, we hear the word postmodernism until we wait and can't wait until it gets buried with a lot of other uh, in terms. But certainly there is a mindset that there is no objective truth out there that can be formulated in words. Yet this is contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Hold the pattern of sound words. Timothy, there are realities that have been conveyed to you in words, and the words have form and structure. You hold to them. You pass them on as the apostolic tradition to others. That's truth in its objective essence. However, we must grow in our understanding not only of the truth in its objective essence, by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, but we must know that truth in its application to the world of men and of things. If that truth is to find expression in our role as pastors, 
preaching and teaching the flock of God publicly and privately, in giving guidance and direction to the people of God, then there must not only be an ever-growing grasp upon the truth in its objective essence, but in its application to the world of men and of things. Years ago, we had a man in the church uh, whose occupation was that of an instructor in auto mechanics in an auto mechanics school. And I understand, as I remember, that from 9 to 12 every day, he lectured on what makes an automobile engine work. What are the parts? What are the pistons? What are the valves? And, and what is the distributor? And how do the points? And how do the plugs? And all the rest. But when he had instructed these men in the objective essence of an automobile engine, then from one to four, they went into the shop, tore down an engine, had the parts in their hands, and then put the engine back together again. Then they saw the theory in its application to the real world of that hunk of iron that sits under the hood, or the bonnet of the car for the sake of our Brits. So brethren, this is what I'm talking about, because each of us by temperament tends either to gravitate to an imbalanced obsession with truth in its objective essence, or in its application to the world of men and things. And over the years, as I've wrestled with these tendencies in my own heart, I've seen it in other men. Uh, they will rather reluctantly say, yes, uh, I, I ought to perhaps memorize some of those definitions in the shorter catechism. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does, with grief and hatred of his sin, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. How are you going to improve on that? But you see, having grasped it in its objective essence with accuracy, now how do I work this out in dealing with someone who professes to be repentant, who is seeking, how can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? And there are some who say, well, those kind of accurate things are uh, really not important. Yes, they are. The closer we can come to expressing God's truth in the forms of sound words, not only as they are deposited in the apostolic tradition, but as the apostolic tradition has been expressed and formulated in the crucible of truth against error in the history of the church and the great creedal statements and the confessions and the catechisms hammered out as a legacy for God's people. Dear men, we've got to love those things. We've got to love it when we hear these words. Who is the redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is our Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God became man and so was and continues to be both God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. I still get the goosebumps when I quote it. There are Decades of intense controversy and the fruit of wrestling with the Word of God. And surely, brethren, we want to pass on as a legacy to our people the form of sound words. And you've got to be honest and ask yourself, am I one that has a predisposition to love theological precision? Then I need to work and pray that God will help me to be equally concerned for how these things work out in the real world of men and of things. And if you're of a more practical bent, and you always want to know the how-to and the why and in what way, you may have to take yourself by the back of the neck and the seat of the pants and pluck yourself down behind your desk and say, I'm going to memorize one question and answer of the shorter casochism per week in the coming year. And do it. Make yourself do it that you might have a balanced ministry, 
that reflects this growing, this maturing perception of the truth of God, both in its objective essence and in its application to the world of men and of things. Now, do you see the importance then of this matter of the intellectual development of the man of God? Listen to the observation made by Ryle quoting Wesley on page 102, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. To one who neglected the duty of private reading and regular study, Wesley wrote as follows. Hence, your talent in preaching does not increase. It is just the same as it was seven years ago. It is lively, but not deep. There's little variety. There's no compass of thought. Reading only can supply this with daily meditation and daily prayer. You wrong yourself greatly by omitting this. You never can be a deep preacher without it any more than a thorough Christian. Oh, begin. Fix some part of every day for private exercises. You may acquire the taste which you have not. What is tedious at first will afterwards be pleasant. Whether you like it or not at first, I'm sorry, whether you like it or not, read and pray daily. It is for your life. There is no other way. Else you will be a trifler all your days and a pretty superficial preacher. Do justice to your own soul. Give it time and means to grow. Do not starve yourself any longer. And then Bridges, page 48, the middle of the page. It is of great moment that the habit of study should, as far as possible, be maintained through life. For the most part, the groundwork only has been laid. Let our early attainments excite, not satisfy our thirst for information, divert, not bound our investigations. If useful habits are gained, they are probably far from being matured. St. Paul's instructions so often alluded to were given, as we have hinted, to an elder of some years standing in the church. Mr. Scott, to the last, combined the student with the minister. If we live only on old stores, as a beloved brother has observed, we shall never enlarge our knowledge. It is allowed that it is not easy diligently to pursue a course of persevering study. Our families and our daily duties must not be neglected. It requires fixed plans, vigorously followed up. Our natural indolence and the love of society must be broken through. Cecil says, Every man, whatever be his natural disposition, who would urge his powers to the highest end, must be a man of solitary studies. As I've observed young men over the years trying to make whatever assessment was legitimate for me to make of their fitness for the ministry, I look for two things, many things, but two things that fit here. Is he a lover of people or only a lover of books? Or is he exclusively a lover of people and not a lover of books? And I've seen both kinds who thought they were called of God to the ministry, who showed no real love for people. They did not spontaneously and viscerally connect with people and love people as people. Not just something to preach to, but they were lovers of men. I've seen others who were great lovers of men, but who couldn't sit longer than five minutes on their backside and do any serious study, and yet they felt they were called to the ministry because they loved people, and people loved them, and they connected well with people. My friend, my brother, you've got to be a lover of books, as well as a lover of people, as well as a lover of Christ, and all the other things that we must love. So, we must be, by the grace of God, men who are committed in terms of the axiom that I've laid before you, seeking a maturing spiritual perception of the truth of God, both in its objective essence and 
in its practical application to the world of men and of things. Now, the big question, how is this maturing spiritual perception of the truth of God to be attained? Well, in the time that remains, let me just give you the first strand of my answer, and it is this. I have three concrete directions and a closing series of cautions. We'll have time in this lecture just to give the first of these three basic directives. Number one, you must make time in your weekly schedule for general reading. I didn't say you must find time. You ought to consider possibly in some way or other consider. No, you must make time in your weekly schedule for general reading. Real deep thorough sermon preparation will force you to read and will therefore contribute to your intellectual vibrancy and freshness. In your sermon preparation, your mind is coming into direct contact not only with the oracles of God, but with other devout minds and well-trained brains who have likewise grappled with that portion of the oracles of God with which you intend to feed God's people. However, I'm making a plea for regular reading beyond that which is necessary for responsible sermon preparation. I'm speaking of the kind of reading which the old masters placed in the category of general rather than specific preparation. They use that terminology and I like it. Now I'm going to think of an analogy that you may think is very carnal. But back in the days when they used to have the Friday night fights and back in Connecticut where I was reared, we had a fellow that was 47 and 0 and they thought he was on his way to become a middleweight champion until he met a left-handed boxer who put him on his back and he was done and he never, he never did was worth much after that. Well, in those main fights, he got to be the head card, the 10-rounder in Madison Square Garden. He always had the undercard and the undercard was made up of what they call club fighters guys who had a record of 12 and 17 or 12 and 12. Well, you see, the club fighter, he had to keep in continual shape. He never knew when he was going to telephone call. You were in the undercard next Saturday night. So unlike the big guys who could afford to wine and dine and get out of shape and then the big fight was coming, they could go off to one of their training camps for six weeks and start running and end up running 15 miles a day and, and working out and get themselves in shape. The club fighter... He had to be in a state of continual preparation and readiness, whereas the others could indulge in periods of total indifference to conditioning and then great concentrated specific preparation. Well, I always like to think that as a preacher, I'm a club fighter. And I need to have continual regimens of mental conditioning continually stretching my mind, continually disciplining my mind to think in areas that my sermon preparation may never take me if I were to preach for another 50 years. And as I say, the old writers saw the benefit of this. Just a sampling out again of Alexander, page 127. 127, it's in your printed notes there. If our brethren are unanimous in anything, it is in Luther's judgment that sound and varied learning must be sustained if we would preserve the church. And down to the last paragraph on that page. There is such a thing as maintaining a transient popularity and having a little usefulness without any deep study. But this fire of straw soon burns out. This cistern soon fails. The preacher who's constantly pouring out and seldom pouring in can pour but a little while. I need hardly caution you against the sententious maxim prevalent among freshmen concerning those great geniuses who read little but think much. They even cite as part of their party one of the greatest readers who ever wrote, as every work of his goes to prove, to wit, Shakespeare. The greatest thinkers have been the greatest readers 
though the converse is by no means true. In reading the writings of those most remarkable for originality and invention and mark, it is in reference to these qualities only the reference is now made. We know not whether most to admire the adventurous flights of their own daring or their extensive acquaintance with all that has been written before on their chosen topics. In other words, he says their genius in what we might call originating, penetrating thought or original and penetrating thought were the fruit of the discipline of their, genu their general intellectual development. And he goes on to say the great point is this, there must be perpetual acquisition. This is the secret of preaching. What theologians say of preparation for death may be said of preparation for preaching. There is habitual and there is actual preparation. The current of our daily study and the gathering of material for a given task. At the end of that page there are evils which can be prevented only by the resolute pursuit of general studies, irrespectively of special pulpit performance. Such habits will tend to keep a man always prepared, and instead of getting to the bottom of his barrel as he grows older, he will be more and more prepared as long as his faculties last. This, my brethren, is what I am making a plea for, that we be committed to this discipline of a balanced reading, uh, committed, making time for regular, programmed, general reading. And I've looked at the clock and the time has uh, gotten away from me again. And so we must break off here and God willing tomorrow, uh, then we will pick up and uh, progress to the next two uh, principles and directives with regard to this matter of our general reading. Well, let's pray and thank God for a good day together and pray that the Lord will bless us as we anticipate coming together tomorrow for the further lectures. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow in your presence and as we hear more and more of the responsibilities laid upon us as pastors, those who are the fulfillment of your promise to your church, I will give them shepherds according to my heart who shall feed them with knowledge and with understanding. Lord, if we are to be such shepherds, we acknowledge we must have minds that are ready to love you and serve you and diligently engage in an ever-growing, ever-expanding understanding of your truth, both in its objective essence and in its application to the world of men and things. We pray that you would forgive us where we have been mentally lazy and have thereby starved our people, where we have allowed the pursuit of the intellectual in some way to erode or undermine our commitment to serve your people in their practical needs, forgive us. Lord, left to ourselves, we are a mass of imbalance. We are a mess, Lord. We need your grace to uphold us and strengthen us and enable us so to order the hours of our days that we may fulfill our holy calling to your praise and to the blessing of your people. We pray that you will take whatever's had the chaff of men's ignorance and blow upon it, whatever has been true to your word and an expression of sound judgment, seal to our hearts and bless it to the end that your people may be blessed. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.